Well, today I have the great honour to be joined by one of Australia's most senior and well-respected journalists, Paul Kelly. Paul, you began your career in journalism in the early 1970s, long time ago now. Long time ago. Just before the Whitlam years, very tumultuous time in Australia. You went on to have what I would call a dazzling career in newspapers, and I say that uh, uh, with great admiration. You're also one of our most respected political and cultural analysts. You've written several classic books on Australian politics. I think it's fair to say that those books are events in themselves. And you regularly write the most profound and wide-ranging reflections on Australia and indeed on the world in your current role as editor-at-large for the Australian newspaper. Can I kick this off by asking what makes a good journalist and do the times in which you're writing help? Well, John, let me begin by first of all saying what a great pleasure it is to be here with you and how much I appreciate the chance for us to have this conversation. Well, that's an intriguing question. What makes a good journalist? And there's no easy formula. I mean, there's no textbook which gives you the answer to successful journalism. I think a successful journalist is like a successful sportsman. You develop your own method, you develop your own technique, you do it your way. Having said that, there are some fundamental principles and they go to inquiry, investigation, asking the right questions, probing, and having the capacity to formulate judgments at the end of the day. And what's very important in journalism is to test your views. Now, in terms of the way journalism has evolved in recent years, I've got to say that I tend to be more of a traditionalist. Uh, I don't think that being an activist and defining yourself as an activist is really equating to the traditions of journalism. And if you say that your task as a journalist is really to see the world and interpret facts and events in one particular way to achieve one particular outcome, I don't think that's serving the public and I don't think that's serving the ethics and traditions of journalism. And I guess the final point I'd make in terms of what makes a good journalist is this, the capacity to change your mind. It's very important when you approach an issue and you assess it, you look at the facts, that you've got a sufficiently open mind so that you can finish up with a conclusion which might be very different from where you began. But you've got to be able to do that in terms of being uh, faithful to the process of investigation and assessment. That's a very challenging set of remarks in terms of the fact that I think most of us now believe that there's a lot of activism amongst journalists and media people today. And in fact, uh, there's tremendous, I think it's fair to say, tremendous cynicism in liberal democracies nowadays about the established media. Uh, Trump, I think, probably struck a note when he popularized the term fake news. And over the past 10 years, we've had countless new media organisations that have sprung up online. This is one of them, I suppose. Uh, they are now becoming serious rivals to the traditional television and print media. And I think the question that comes out of that to me would be to, to what extent do you think that cynicism and uh, lack of trust in traditional media is, is justified? Journalism is the first cut of history. It's the first cut. And what this means is it's going to be, by definition, imperfect. Now, we all know it's imperfect. And I think that behoves journalists to display a degree of humility. We like to think we're masters of the subject, but it's important always to look back three, four, five, ten years after events when you've got a better historical perspective and look at what you said about them at the yeah. time. That's very sobering. That's very sobering. And what it highlights is simply the fact that we're all imperfect and journalism, even though one can strive to do the best possible job, that's an imperfect project. 
And the public understands this. And there is a degree of public cynicism about media and journalism, and that's good. That's healthy. That's important for the public to have a degree of scepticism uh, about institutions and particularly about media when media tend to be arrogant. And if media start to lecture people about what they ought to do and what they ought to think, then I think that just generates more scepticism on the part of media. But you've talked about the most recent phenomenon about uh, fake news and fake history and so on. And I think there is a lot in this. I guess I'd make two points about the changes in contemporary media. The first is that the business model is in crisis. Yep. And this is part of the transition from the industrial age to the digital age. And so what we see is we see the decline of advertising revenue in the so-called rivers of gold which provided the enormous sources of revenue which funded journalism for such a long period of time in this country and in other countries. So the fact that the mainstream media faces a crisis in its business model does impinge very significantly on the day-to-day -day activities of journalists and media. It's got to do that. And so that does uh, present difficulties and problems for the way media do their job. I think the second point uh, to make about it is that these days media are defined more and more by their political profile. Every media organisation has a political profile, there's no doubt about that. That's part of your editorial positioning, that's part of your business model. But what this means of course is that it accentuates the polarisation in the mm. community. Um, there's no such thing as impartial media, okay? Uh, there is no media organisation in the world that fits some sort of pure definition of impartiality. That doesn't exist. And the way the media professionals and the way the media managers run their organisation is based on a recognition that they have a political brand and that political brand is central to the support of their customers, their listeners, their viewers, etc. And what this means, of course, is that you'll have different media organisations reporting on the same events in a completely different way. Now, this fans the idea, I think, of, uh, dis of disputation in the community. It fans the idea of distrust, particularly if um, you're watching a particular media outlet, it doesn't occur all that much that you, that you don't agree with the politics of that media outlet or that particular media brand. So in other words, what you're getting is, you're getting the media adding to political and social fragmentation. Well, there is, that leads straight into, a, for me, a, a very interesting area indeed. There is one media organisation that does still have rivers of gold provided by the taxpayer. It's the ABC. Uh, and I uh, try and put this delicately, but I would say that it should not have a political brand, but it probably does. Speaking personally, I feel that I should never know what the ABC's view of any piece of news is, but I invariably feel that I do know uh, what its slant is and what its take is. How do you see the ABC in this age when the media's moved on so much uh, so much of it's online and what have you. Is there still a role for the ABC and, and, and are conservative criticisms of it justified? Well, I think there's certainly a role for the ABC given the uh, pressures that um, uh, the private sector media now faces. But look, frankly speaking, there is no more arid or counterproductive debate in Australia today than about media bias. Now, I want to go back to the point I just made. Whether we're talking about the New York Times or Fox News or CNN or the Washington Post or the Financial Times or the Guardian or the BBC or the Daily Telegraph, the Age, the Sydney Morning Herald, the ABC, the Australian, 
you name the media organisation, it has a political profile. But I worry that this problem of the polarisation of the media feeds the polarisation, the atomization of our culture and our society. This is the modern world. Yeah. And, and if you're that consumer, the consumer you just described, and you want to test yourself and test your views about what's happening in the world, what's happening in Australia, you've got to go to multiple media outlets. That's what you've got to do. Yeah. Um, uh, but this highlights the problem that I'm talking about. Most people naturally don't do that. They've only got a certain amount of time. They've got their favorite media outlets. We all do, we all, we all have those outlets. And what that means of course is that you're getting a particular view of the world conveyed by your favourite media brand, whether that's liberal, conservative, uh, populist, progressive, or whatever it is. And so this is the way that modern societies in the West develop, and it's the way culture is formed. And that's why we are increasingly on the road to more and more division because ordinary people in the suburbs are developing quite different views, quite different views as a result of their media consumption. And there's an offline version of that, of course, as well. People feed themselves and are fed the information that suits their perspective, their bias, and it becomes ever harder, I suspect, offline uh, to, to gain a range of views as well. That's human nature. That's yeah. human nature. Um, we love to be reinforced in our prejudices. Of course, uh, we like to be affirmed. Uh, we <laughs> like to have we like to have media outlets that reinforce our own views, and we feel more confident and assured as a result of that. That is simply human nature. Point taken. Now, to change gears a bit, I've always seen you as brilliant at capturing the personal element in politics, the importance of leaders and personalities. But you've always placed the personal in a bigger national and global context. Can I ask you how important the personalities in leaders and leaders in shaping a country for better or for worse? I remember Paul Keating saying once, when you change the leader, you change the country. I think there's a lot in the Keating quote. It's an exaggeration, but it's also a fundamental truth. Uh, two of my most favorite politicians are Abraham Lincoln and Winston Churchill. They changed history. Yes. Uh, but history's filled with traps, isn't it? Imagine if the South had won the Civil War. How would Lincoln have been seen? The victors write the history. And imagine if Churchill had, for example, died in 1939, he would have essentially been seen as a substantial political failure. So uh, there's no doubt that leaders make history, leaders change history, but you've also got to assess all the traps along the way. So no one could doubt that Donald Trump has changed history. Um, some leaders are deceptive. If you look at Robert Menzies, who won seven elections in this country, Australia changed a lot under the long period of Menzies' rule. But in a sense, Menzies' genius was to create the impression there was nothing happening. There was nothing to get excited about. Stay cool, stay relaxed, stay comfortable. The country was changing, but this was a prime minister of reassurance. So that's another example of leadership. A very different example is what happened to Australia during the Hawke and Keating period. I was a great supporter of the economic and social reforms of Bob Hawke and Paul Keating. Now, their genius was to keep winning elections amid a period of great change. So they were able to introduce very, very significant reforms but take the country with them and keep winning elections. So that was a case study in electoral success uh, fused with very substantial change. That's quite unusual. So 
you've got to appreciate that there are there are different different forms of political leaders for different periods of time. Point taken. You've written in you know, a March of the Patriots that perhaps that 25 years or so of exceptionally sound and innovative leadership where, where leaders led in a way, by various means they took people with them against what they might otherwise have been prepared to do. As I understand it, you perhaps see that as an aberration in Australia's history, that the norm is more chaotic and less inspired. Well, that was a golden period. I think the period of Hawke, Keating and most of the John Howard Prime Ministership was a period of really significant change and reorientation for the country. And what was important about that is while there were fierce political differences and highly contested election campaigns, if you look back on the fundamental direction, a lot of the fundamental direction is consolidated by a bipartisanship. And so a lot of the things done in that period have stuck. The direction of the country established in that period has continued. And there's been a degree of political settlement about those changes. I think that's really important uh, because that essentially means that the electorate has accepted a number of those changes. Let's take a couple of examples. One, for example, is Medicare. Medicare, of course, is one of the social glories of the Labor Party under the Whitlam period and the Hawke period, legislating uh, the Medicare arrangements. One of the first things John Howard did when he returned to the Liberal leadership in the mid-1990s was he said, the political war about Medicare is over. The Liberal Party now accepts it. That's really important, very significant. And then if you look at the industrial relations system, one of the things that Keating said as Prime Minister was he initiated the system of enterprise bargaining. That is essentially moving away from the centralised wage fixation system that the Liberal Party by then wanted to ditch and saying Labor will now commit to a system of enterprise bargaining. So it wasn't fully fledged deregulation of the Labor market, but it was a very significant change yes. by the Labor Party away from centralised wage fixation to enterprise bargaining. And that stuck, although that system's in a degree of trouble now. But essentially, essentially, this is how you get a political change and it's, it's really important to try and bet it down. Now, one of the arguments I've made more recently is that governing is much harder in Australia today and reform is harder still. And you can see that, if you like, in the experience of the last four Prime Ministers, Kevin Rudd, Julie Gillard, Tony Abbott and Malcolm Turnbull. And if you look at the experience of these four Prime Ministers, there's no doubt at all that, that all of them are examples of the greater degree of governing difficulty in this country, and that's a function of economic, social and political changes, which we can talk about. Um, and it also highlights the fact, it also highlights the fact that true leadership, true successful leadership is a very difficult commodity to find. And while Rudd, Gillard, Abbott and Turnbull all had impressive qualities to recommend in terms of leaders, I think it's fair to say that none of those four proved to be a fully fledged successful political leader. All of them had severe difficulties in terms of their own side of politics, winning acceptance from, from their own parliamentary party, let alone winning acceptance from the country. And so what this highlights are some of the difficulties that democracy faces at this point in time. I, uh, I understand very well what you're saying, and even just from the perspective as one who served from time to time as acting Prime Minister, the pressure of that job, the need to stay calm and keep your head when all around are losing theirs, 
I had enough of an insight into that to know that the sort of human beings who can do it are very, very, very rare indeed. And when we find them, we ought to treasure them. The other thing that it seems to me out of what you've said that we ought to recognise, though, that's of critical importance, is that if you stop and think about what's happened since those years, the, the great financial crisis, now COVID, Australia is in far better shape than we would otherwise have been. We've shouldered this mess in a more effective way, it seems to me, than we, we would have otherwise if we'd not had that golden era with its reforms, its improvements in productivity, improvements in employment, in real wages, in real wealth, and the winding back of public sector debt. There's a very powerful message in that, is there not, for the right leader to be able to say, we've got to recreate those sorts of principles, make those tough decisions for the next shock, because there will be future shocks, there always are. That's what I call Australian exceptionalism. And there's no doubt that our performance as a country since the 1970s in international terms, measured by the OECD norm, has really improved significantly. Mm. And this is according to some of the critical measures. Let's just take a couple of them. One is economic growth. So there's no doubt that the reforms of the Australian economy and our success uh, in terms of having a, a higher productivity performance has been enormously impressive um, over this period of Hawke, Keating and Howard. So this has led to a greater upsurge in Australian prosperity. Now, while post 2003, a lot of this came off the back of China's industrialization and the benefits of our relationship with China, before that, it came from the reform age. Yeah. It came from our own efforts, and that was very important. Second point to make um, about our global indicators is the distribution of the benefits. That is, if you look at the question of opportunity, um, income distribution, uh, there's no doubt that uh, Australia has been um, uh, more successful than a lot of other countries in terms of spreading the benefits of income, spreading the benefits of wealth. That's not to say we don't have problems with inequality. Of course we do. All countries do. But I think what's happened is if you look at the spectrum and you've got the United States on one side of the spectrum with a highly um, unequal society and uh, the Europeans on the other side of the spectrum with uh, a lot of equality, but they've paid for that equality with the, with the lack of economic growth and lack of economic opportunity uh, and lack of dynamic economies. Australia tends to be positioned in the middle. And that's what I call Australian exceptionalism. I think we've done very well in terms of generating the wealth and having a pretty good effort in terms of the redistribution. And that has served us very well in terms of these most recent crises. That is the global financial crisis of 2008, 2010, and now more recently, the global pandemic. Given the serious challenges that we now face, I think there's a real question about whether our primary problems now lie in the area of which economic levers to pull or whether we've got the cultural <coughs> heft to agree to the pulling of those levers in the first place. And to broaden this right out for a moment, you've spoken of the crisis of Western liberalism. Can you elaborate on what you mean by the crisis of Western liberalism? I think the foundations of Western liberalism, let's start there. I think the foundations of Western liberalism lie in uh, respect for the individual yeah. and equal respect for all individuals, regardless of their makeup. So this is the this is the classic this is the classic foundation idea of Western liberalism, and I think within that idea, we've seen then various political traditions develop in the West: conservative, liberal, social democratic, uh, progressive, and they can operate on the foundation stone of the classic 
liberal ethic in terms of respect for the individual. Now, I think the problem we're seeing in recent times is that we're seeing on the extremes of our political systems, on the left and on the right, new political movements, which I think are challenging that foundation stone. Now, one of them is reactionary and one of them is revolutionary. The reactionary movement is on the far right. And you see this in terms of the rise of conservative populists. I guess um, the most notable one being Donald Trump, of course. And uh, these are movements which challenge a lot of the fundamentals. That is, Trump is open about the fact that he thinks the United States political system has failed. That the system of globalization and free markets and the Washington, the Washington based political system has failed and he came in to fundamentally change it. And these populists from the conservative right seeking to overturn the system uh, appeal to nationalism, xenophobia, protectionism, uh, with an overlaid popular sentiment. Now, of course, they are appealing to genuine grievance. There's no doubt that there has been really genuine failures of the system. And in particular, you look at the United States, just, just look at what happened to real wages in the United States over the course of the previous 25 years. So Trump had a very rich load of grievance on which to play. But there's no doubt that this emergence of this reactionary form of populist conservatism, while you can understand its foundations and what drove it, I think it is particularly dangerous. And I am a very strong critic of Donald Trump and the Trump presidency. If you then look at the other side of politics, I think we've seen the emergence of what I call a revolutionary movement from the left. And this essentially is the transition of a lot of left wing thinking <coughs> from liberalism to progressivism and a particular sort of progressivism based on identity politics. And so this rejects the idea of respect for the individual as an individual and it has a view of human nature being defined by multiple identities. Your identity in terms of race, sex, uh, gender, various other characteristics, and saying that I want to be treated according to my identity. I want to be treated and I want society and I want the laws to treat me according to my identity and I want different treatment for different individuals according to their identity. Now, this is a revolutionary attack, as far as I can see, on the tenets of classic liberalism. And I think at the end of the day, the, the moral and intellectual foundations of this attack, this revolutionary attack on liberalism is likely to be more damaging and more dangerous than the attack from the right, from the populist conservatives, because I think the attack from the left is more on the foundations of liberalism. So when I talk about the crisis of liberalism, I'm talking about the fact that it is under assault from both the left and the right. And both these assaults are based on very significant exploitation of community sentiment, community concerns, worries, and upheaval. And just as Trump has a lot of supporters, there's no doubt that those people promoting identity politics, they have a lot of supporters as well. And so I think what we see here um, within Western societies, within Western politics is we've got 
an internal crisis. And that internal crisis goes to the foundations of Western liberalism and in a sense, the foundations and the traditions of Western civilization. Amazing, really, that Black Lives Matter identities want to pull down a statue of, uh, of Teddy Roosevelt, who was a man who passionately argued and very articulately argued that no person should be above the law and no person should be below it. <coughs> so now you've had a breakdown in that sort of very, I think, central, I agree with you, tenet, that respect for all lies at the heart of the Western model. But so, <laughs> some would say that the so-called crisis of liberalism is really a crisis of liberalism unchained from Christianity with its emphasis on human dignity and even love for your enemies. And you yourself have said the roots of our civilization lie in Judeo-Christian traditions. You also, and I've never forgotten this, you went so far as to warn uh, in the context of the, um, uh, I think 2017 was it, election, that we may as a country be coming in danger of becoming ungovernable because of the loss of what you called the virtue and civic glue which once held us together. Now the classic virtues go to the issue of individual character, uh, but the modern idea of virtue lies with causes and people in those causes. So the, the dividing line you know, between virtue and non-virtue is not somewhere in here, it's between two people and their opposing ideologies, which is an extraordinary shift. So I just wonder whether you see a connection in your experience between the decline of liberalism and the secularization of the West, the de-Christianization of the West. Well, I think there's undoubtedly a connection, but sorting out exactly what the connection is and what might cause and effect be is extremely challenging. And we need to be particularly careful about this. So <clears throat> let's start from a few fundamental points here. I think one of the difficulties we face in Australia and in other Western countries is we no longer agree on what is the virtue of society. Yeah. We no longer agree on what is virtue. We disagree, for example, on fundamental moral questions. We're divided about marriage. We're divided about uh, how people can die or should die. We're divided about how children should be raised. We're divided about how they should be taught in school, what their curriculum should be. We're divided about how religion should be seen in civil society and in, and in secular society. We are confused about the relationship between secular society and, and religion. Um, we are confused and divided about what constitutes citizenship duty. And when you put all those things together, and I've listed a whole series of areas which are now the subject of dispute in our society, we disagree on virtue. Now, this is a very difficult position to be in because if you look at a lot of the political debate in Western societies in the 20th century, um, a lot of this debate was very fierce and very contested, um, particularly about the distribution of economic benefits, uh, socialism versus free enterprise, uh, the distribution of wealth between profits and wages, and some of it went to a more fundamental position in terms of uh, the debate about communism versus the free society. But essentially, most of that debate, we saw society still united by the question of what constitutes a virtuous society. And so I think we're now seeing a fundamental change in the 21st century. We've gone through a threshold. Now, we were building up to this for a long period of time with the development of postmodernism from the 1960s onwards. But there's been a flowering of this uh, development uh, in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. And the American writer and journalist David Brooks, I think, has captured this brilliantly. And 
um, I think a very good way of putting it. He talked about the differences between the current generation and the greatest generation, yep. the World War II generation. Now, I know that generation well. That was the generation of my parents. That was the generation of people who lived through the Great Depression and who lived through World War II and then went on to rebuild their societies in the 1950s. That was a generation that lived on personal sacrifice, that saw monumental achievements and was conspicuous for its humility. Yep. And what do we have now? And Brooks says, well, what we have now is the big me. People are focused on themselves, their feelings, their emotions, uh, uh, what I need uh, to do to be true to myself, uh, how I become successful, how I become more famous, how I become a quasi-celebrity uh, in my own street or suburb or city, and that this is a fundamental change. I mean, the greatest generation weren't interested in the big me. I mean, nothing in terms of cultural inclination could be um, further uh, divorced from their concerns and preoccupations. And so essentially we've seen, I think, a significant change in human outlook, in the way human beings in the West think of themselves. And what we've seen here is the purging of any sense of original sin. Now, the idea of original sin um, uh, comes from the sense that human beings are flawed creatures. We're all imperfect. We're all sinners. And the task of life is self-improvement and the seeking of redemption to become better people. That sense is, is now to, to a great extent lost, and that sense has nothing to do with the big me at all. So I do think that there's been a fundamental change there. Now, how does this relate to religion? Well, it relates partly to religion, because what I'm talking about is that uh, I think the decline of religion means there's less concord and agreement in society about what constitutes virtue. And I think the decline of religion has been a catalyst for the development of this narcissistic sense of the individual and, indi and individual development, uh, which David Brooks calls uh, the big me. Now, it's not it's not 100% driven by the decline of religion. What's more important, I think, is the decline of cultural tradition. It's the decline of cultural tradition, I think, that is the real problem. So what I would say in terms of trying to resurrect uh, some of the virtuous foundations of society, I wouldn't say um, we can't do this unless everyone reconverts to Christianity. I would not say that. But what I would say is, we can't do this unless we go back and rekindle faith in our cultural traditions. And it's those cultural traditions, many of which related to Christianity, which have been so important in the successful development of Western society. And if we lose, if we lose those cultural traditions, we're in trouble. And one of my fiercest critiques of progressives is that their campaign, their explicit and implicit goal is to destroy those cultural traditions. Essentially, for instance, in Australia by saying that our history is one of shame, that our history is one of invasion, colonisation, racism, exploitation, sexism, patriarchy, and we've got to either uh, purge the past or forget the past to create a better future. That to me is the single greatest folly 
in terms of the current uh, cultural debate in this country. Fascinating. Um, uh, David Brooks, of course, uh, Road to Character, is, is really worth reading if anyone's listening to this and wants to explore what he has to say, because it is very striking. I agree with you. Uh, but then there's Arthur Brooks, who's written a book uh, arguing that this whole thing that Brooks talks about, the big me, has led to a situation of enormous judgmentalism. In fact, I think he says you combine anger, which you can see everywhere in America at the moment and in much of the West, with disgust, you get contempt. And when people are contemptuous of one another, it's almost impossible to rebuild the sort of rational discussion around issues uh, and differences rather than personalities. Thank you for watching this episode. We appreciate your support. If you value vital conversations like this one, be sure to subscribe to the channel there and also click the notification bell to stay up to date with new releases. Thank you.